Hello, welcome to the channel Why Stories. Enjoy watching. Someone knocked twice on the office door. Mateo Soto, without diverting from the computer monitor where he was filling out some documents, tried to shout as loudly as possible, come in, so that he could be heard beyond the door. The person knocking clearly heard the doctor's response because immediately after the doctor said it, the door opened and a man entered the office. He looked quite respectable, a dark blue expensive suit that matched well with a red tie and a snow white shirt suited this slim, light-haired man who appeared to be around 35. The man's name was Pedro Jimenez and upon entering the office with a folded warm jacket in his hands, he greeted the doctor. Hello, Mateo. I came to you to ask about my test results, the man said, taking a seat opposite the doctor. Are they ready? Pedro, hello, the doctor nodded, still not diverting his attention from the monitor. Wait a moment. Hang your jacket on the rack, he said, pointing to the hanger behind the patient. Pedro hung his heavy winter jacket on the rack, and it nearly toppled over. Okay, Pedro, your test results. The doctor finished dealing with electronic documents, shifting all his attention to the desk to find the documents, but this time in paper form. Your test results, where are they? He began sorting through some stacks while the patient was sitting back in his place. Okay. Pedro was sitting calmly, very attentively watching every move of Mateo Soto. Okay, here we go. Pedro Jimenez, the doctor, licked his lips. Let's see what we have found. I really hope nothing has been found, the man said with a hint of irony. The patient felt several seconds of the doctor's silence turn into hours. Okay, Mateo said on an exhale. Pedro, I will now tell you your diagnosis. The doctor looked very busy, trying to quickly read numerous medical terms from the document to combine them into one result. He quickly scanned the paper, making Pedro worry extra in anxious anticipation. Okay, Pedro, you came to us because you complained of pain in the liver. Is that correct? Well, most likely, it's the liver, the man replied, placing his left hand on the right side of his torso, under the ribs. Right here, somewhere. And what other symptoms did you have? What else have you complained about? Pedro began recalling the symptoms that prompted him to seek help at this prestigious and expensive clinic. Well, nausea, vomiting, he began listing. Overall, I didn't have an appetite. So, Mateo set aside the sheet of paper. Looking at the results of your tests, I have a very mixed impression. Tell me, have you noticed recently that you, for example, have lost a lot of weight? Yes, I've noticed, the man said tensely. What's the matter? The doctor leaned slightly forward, interlocking his fingers, and said with some unclear regret. Pedro, he was trying to choose his words, I have reviewed your test results. Now you have listed the symptoms with which you came to us, he paused slightly, creating a one-second pause. You know, sometimes even the most accurate instruments and programs can make mistakes, and in your case, I sincerely hope they are wrong. Mateo, don't beat around the bush, the patient interrupted in a serious tone. What's with my test results? What's the diagnosis? Pedro, I have to inform you that you have liver cancer. Based on the tests, I wouldn't say it's very bad, but there are reasons to be concerned, of course. Pedro Jimenez stopped hearing the doctor after he got to know his diagnosis. The world completely turned upside down, lost all its colors, and became gloomily gray. All of this happened in a second, in one moment. The man just froze, staring at one point and almost not moving. All the energy that was in his body rushed to his head and immediately dissipated. In just a few seconds, the man lost all strength to do anything. He was now thinking only of one thing, why? Why did this illness strike him? He took very good care of his health. He never drank or smoked, exercised in the gym, and adhered to a balanced diet. Every one and a half years, he tried to undergo examinations at the most decent and expensive clinics in the country thanks to the possibilities available to him. 
Pedro always took care of himself and tried to consider every tiny detail, down to the last speck of dust in his apartment or the reduced humidity in the air. The only thing Pedro couldn't sacrifice for the sake of his health was work. It was, perhaps, his only weakness. He worked a lot. He tried to completely switch to the night mode because, during this dark but truly enchanting and beautiful time of day, his mind was most active. The transition to night mode was also influenced by the fact that the main office of his company, where he regularly appeared four times a month, was in a different time zone. Pedro managed to set up his own business to operate on its own, without his constant presence, and, taking advantage of this, fulfilled his long-standing dream to move to the north. This place always attracted him, and he often dreamed of moving to this snowy place. And it turned out that when it was daytime in the city where his company was located, it was already late evening for him. It was much easier to manage the business this way, and, as mentioned earlier, Pedro found it much easier and more comfortable to work at night. The doctor took the paper with the patient's test results once again. He carefully looked down and responded, Yes, there is. The treatment can cost a lot and last a long time, but you can recover. In your case, the main thing is not to delay. What could have caused the cancer? As if ignoring Mateo, Pedro muttered, You know, Pedro, there can be many reasons, alcohol abuse, heredity. Alcohol abuse? At that moment, Pedro gave Mateo a very menacing look. Alcohol abuse? He repeated separately. Well, you know, this reason is highlighted as one of the main one. Are you out of your mind, Mateo? The man began to shout. He couldn't contain his emotions. All the thoughts that had appeared in his head over the last minute, this extremely overloaded vessel, couldn't withstand it, and it burst. I've never drunk in my life. I've always taken care of my health and followed a diet. I could never even think of starting to drink, and now you're saying that I have cancer because I'm an alcoholic? Are you out of your mind? Pedro, calm down, sit, please, the doctor said cautiously. Your emotions are taking over common sense right now. Please calm down and let's talk calmly. I don't intend to talk to you. Pedro abruptly stood up from the chair, took his jacket from the hanger, and walked towards the door. Then, turning around, he addressed Mateo. I think I understand. You gave me a false diagnosis to extort money from me for treatment. You thought you could catch a big fish. But you won't get anything. And slamming the door, he left the doctor's office. Augusta, I don't know what to do. The man was almost crying. Pedro, calm down, his wife Augusta replied, sitting next to him and soothingly stroking his back. It's nothing serious. They just wanted to scam you for money at this clinic. Just go to another one. You don't have cancer, Pedro. They are just frauds. Augusta, but what if I do? He turned and looked at his wife. Before him, there was an exceptionally beautiful woman who was already over 30 but looked very good. Like her husband, she adhered to a diet of proper nutrition, regularly visited the gym, and always took care of herself. Partly, Augusta's status dictated these rules. She was the wife of a well-known and quite wealthy man, and appearing with him in public required her to be a real beauty. She had been invited for photo sessions for various magazines more than once, and almost always, her photos were on their covers. She, in accordance with her status, used expensive cosmetics and always chose prestigious branded clothing for herself, but at home, she could let herself wear regular clothes without makeup. Pedro, calm down, she said, looking at her husband with beautiful brown eyes. Honestly, I think they just wanted to get money from you. That's it. I completely agree with you in this regard. If you're so afraid, just go to another clinic and get checked there. Augusta, what if they confirm I have the cancer too? Anyway, I don't think you won't be able to overcome this. You have always been very determined and persistent. And even if you are ill, you will cope with this ailment, and I will help you with it. Really? Pedro looked at his wife with the same desperate look. Of course, Pedro. Her beautiful, symmetrical, 
glamorous lips spread into a kind and sincere smile. Augusta was ready to support her husband in everything, as it seemed at that moment. They met when Pedro urgently decided to replace several employees in his company. His business was based on selling household appliances, and he had several large stores around the capital. As it turned out then, the money that the management and major shareholders of the company, including Pedro himself, decided to allocate to buy a place and open a new branch with a large area in a major shopping center somehow disappeared. There were lengthy disputes with the company's accounting department because the amount allocated was quite large, but along the way, where it was supposed to be divided into several parts and directed to the owners of the shopping center, the contractor who was doing the renovation in the new branch, and other needs, it turned out to be significantly reduced. The company faced a significant financial hole, and the management needed to find out who took the money. During the lengthy investigations, it was revealed that one of the deputy directors, who was knowingly appointed to the new retail point, had family ties with the chief accountant, and they simply divided the money. An emergency shareholder meeting was convened, and they decided that such things shouldn't have happened again. Urgent personnel changes were made in the company, and new employees were hired. In the head of the accounting department, there was a seemingly inconspicuous woman who calmly worked, was always polite with the company's management, and unquestionably carried out all assignments. Pedro decided that such employees should have been rewarded, so he awarded the girl a bonus. She really worked well, never complained about any bad conditions, and didn't steal a penny. As often happens in a work environment, they had an affair. Pedro began to show signs of attention to Augusta. She quickly got it and started reciprocating. After a year and a half of their relationship, the young couple got married. Augusta was very happy at the wedding and was able to choose a very expensive wedding dress for herself as Pedro appointed her as the chief accountant and significantly increased her salary. The couple had a truly luxurious wedding. All friends and close relatives were invited. At the exit from the civil registry, a long white limousine awaited the newlyweds and the driver handed them a cage with white doves. Pedro and Augusta let the birds fly away kissed once again, and headed to the restaurant hall rented by the groom to celebrate this solemn event. All right, now I want to be alone. The husband averted his gaze from his wife and looked somewhere on the floor. I think I'll go to my office. Okay, dear, Augusta replied. Take care. The man left the living room for his office. The office was quite minimalist, precisely as Pedro envisioned it during its setup. It was a relatively small room with panoramic windows overlooking the snow-covered city. Pedro sat by the window, with his back to it, and the desk at which he usually worked faced the entrance to the room. Pedro disliked it when someone stood or walked behind him while working. It stressed him out, prevented him from concentrating on work because he thought that someone standing behind him might peek at his work, steal something, or do something else. It was on a subconscious level. Of course, it wasn't worth it since he didn't invite unfamiliar and unverified people to his apartment, especially his office. But even in the depths of his soul, fears of competition still rang loudly. Pedro came to this conclusion. He tried his best to hide his work until he finally completed it, so that no one could peek and steal anything. On the plain gray table, there was nothing except a laptop and a half-empty organizer. On the sides, to the left and right of the workspace, there were a few shelves, which, like the organizer on the table, were only half filled with random books. At night, Pedro turned on the lighting in the office, which was controlled by a remote control placed right in the organizer. The lighting itself was orange-yellow and very soft, so that the man could relax to the fullest and concentrate on work. Sitting in a comfortable ergonomic chair of a dark gray color, Pedro leaned back and started looking at the ceiling. He didn't want anything at all. Usually, if he skipped breakfast in the morning, he would crave a snack a couple of hours later, but today was an exception. He hadn't eaten since morning, and now it seemed like he would never want to. The world completely lost its colors, becoming gloomy. He didn't feel like crying or shouting throughout the apartment in challenging situations or moments of life. The resilience to stress he had developed over the years helped him with that. 
But in this case, when he realized that metastases could spread throughout his body at any moment, even his well-developed stress resilience hardly coped. In an instant, he seemed to lose the desire to live. Apathy, fatigue, which he had previously ignored, and some previously unknown loss of meaning in life now seized power in Pedro's mind. He had tried not to let such feelings linger in his mind for too long before, but now he had no other feelings at all. So he had been sitting for about an hour, gradually realizing that he needed to pull himself together. Inaction and constant pondering over the situation wouldn't lead to anything good. A week passed. During this time, Pedro and his wife Augusta searched the internet for a clinic with good ratings and reviews, aiming to avoid falling victim to scammers. Yes, they sincerely believed that Mateo Soto was just a fraudster trying to profit from a wealthy client by giving him the wrong diagnosis. The family tried to find a suitable clinic as quickly as possible. They looked at private and expensive ones to avoid encountering this fraud again. Eventually, Pedro found one, but the clinic was not located in the city. It was in another part of the country, and they had to take a flight to get there. The private hospital, specializing in the diagnosis of oncological diseases, seemed suitable in terms of clients' ratings. However, the cost of the examination alone was quite significant for the family. Maybe we should look for another one? Augusta suggested it when Pedro showed her the chosen option online. It's too expensive and far, don't you think? I think it would be better to find something closer. Augusta, he looked at her with an unclear and somewhat indignant expression. We didn't find a single decent clinic here. One is reviews saying that the staff behaves inappropriately with patients, another overcharges unreasonably, and the third has no normal reviews at all. Here, on the other hand, is a clinic specializing in the detection and treatment of cancer. Yes, the prices are high, but I value my life much more. And if it's true, if they diagnose cancer, these expenses will be very justified. Dear, Augusta romantically embraced her husband. If you think it's right, go ahead and spend huge amounts on your health. I'm not forcing you not to do it, and I'm not discouraging you. If you think it's right, go there. It's for your health. She kissed him on the cheek. But only if it doesn't affect our way of life. Do you understand it? In what sense? In this sense... Pedro, I don't want to rummage through dumpsters and search for food. Spend any amount of money, just as long as we continue to live the way we did. All right, I understand. The man extricated himself from his wife's embrace. I'll still call this clinic and consult with them. He returned to his office. After copying the contact number of the private clinic from the website, he pasted it into the input field and pressed the green call button. He heard pleasant soothing music playing for a short while. The reception didn't keep him waiting long. Hello, welcome. My name is Toya. How can I help you? The girl introduced herself. Hello, the man replied anxiously. My name is Pedro, and I would like to check for cancer. I've already been diagnosed with liver cancer in one clinic, but I believe that they... Pedro almost said something that wasn't customary to mention in such conversations. That they just made a mistake with the diagnosis. Trust in their medicine is undermined, so I would like to be examined specifically at your clinic. Okay, Pedro, I understand you. Look, the cancer checkup at our clinic will be a relatively quick process compared to others. We'll tailor the treatment to you, of course, on an individual basis. You can discuss this in more detail with our treating physician, Roberto Fernandez. He will provide specific advice on your situation. Thank you, Toya. Please tell me how much the treatment will cost at your clinic. Well, Pedro, the cost of treatment will depend on the stage of your disease, the methods of treatment, and other factors. But I'll warn you right away, it will be an amount exceeding $3 million. This is the minimum cost for the mildest treatment methods of the safest variety. Okay, Toya, I got you. When can I schedule a visit? When is convenient for you? I can schedule a consultation with the doctor for you. The soonest available time. I can be there at any moment. Pedro was indeed ready to fly there right now. 
the soonest available time, the girl said, and Pedro heard the sound of pages turning in a notebook. The day after tomorrow at 2 p.m. Will that suit you? Yes, perfectly, the man rejoiced. He had already started to anticipate that he would have to wait a long time to visit this clinic, but as it turned out, he shouldn't have even worried. Okay, then I'll schedule you in. When you arrive, I'll personally meet you, and we'll talk about your situation. Wonderful, Toya. Pedro exclaimed, overwhelmed with joy for the chance to save his life. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye, all the best, the girl said with a relaxing tone, and the potential client of this clinic hung up the phone. He put the phone on the table. He sincerely rejoiced that the day after tomorrow he would actively start treating his recently identified ailment. There was no longer that pronounced apathy and fatigue, on the contrary, the realization that his health, and most importantly, his life, would be in reliable hands gave him additional energy, joy, and ordinary human happiness. Augusta. He practically ran out of the office and headed towards the kitchen. I called that clinic. I'm flying there the day after tomorrow for a consultation with the doctor. Wow. His wife exclaimed in response. Congratulations, Pedro, she hugged him again. How much will the treatment cost? They said the cost is individual each time, depending on the specific case, but they mentioned that the minimum I can expect is $3 million. That's the absolute minimum. In my case, as I understand it, it will be more. From what she heard, Augusta was literally shocked. $3 million? She asked again. This is robbery. Pedro, Augusta, this is first and foremost about my life and health. If something threatens me, I'm willing to spend any amount to protect myself. I won't save on this. But three million, dear. Why does this amount bother you so much? The husband was offended. Pedro, where will we get these three million? By the way, it's not just three million, but many times more, because, as you said yourself, in your case, it will be more expensive. I wouldn't want to take money from those savings we set aside for buying a seaside cottage. Pedro became even more confused. Are you serious right now? He asked. Yes, Pedro, I am serious, Augusta exclaimed somewhat anxiously. More than half of that money is mine, from my salary, and I wouldn't want to take it out to then spend another ten years saving up the necessary amount. All right, the husband clapped his hands. Then I'll sell my share in the company. What did you say? The husband's statement plunged the wife into a real shock, even more than the amount she had just heard for the treatment. Pedro, have you completely lost your mind? Yes, Augusta, I have. I'd rather live poorly, but I'll live, than indulge in luxury for the remaining short time. If you don't want to spend a part of the money from that account we set up to save for a cottage, I apologize. I'll do what the circumstances dictate. I have no other ideas. Yes, Pedro, I don't want to. The wife shouted even louder. I'm only sorry because I've been saving money from my salary for several years. Yes, I know there's your part there too, but I won't allow you to touch my long-standing dream. I want to live by the sea. Pedro didn't expect to hear such words from his own wife. He felt hurt in an instant, and he even pitied himself somehow. All right, Augusta, I got you. I'm going to sell the company. Sell it. Good luck to you. Go ahead and cure your non-existent cancer. You're just wasting money, you know, right? I don't want to hear from you anymore, he said, turned silently, and left his office. It seemed like Pedro had a serious quarrel with Augusta. She couldn't accept the fact that her husband's own health and life were much more valuable than any money or a seaside cottage, and she didn't even want to lend him money for treatment. She was an economist by education and was good at saving and accumulating, but she did it for herself. Pedro was sitting in his office again and grieving. It was getting dark, and he turned on his soft lighting, which was originally designed to alleviate stress, relax, and distract from negative thoughts, but now it didn't help. 
For some reason, all the major decisive changes in a man's life lately happened instantly, from mood swings to complex decisions. So, first, his life turned upside down after Matteo Soto's diagnosis. Then he had a quarrel with Augusta, as a result of which the man concluded that his wife wasn't very loyal to him. This led to the instant decision to sell the business. Even after announcing this decision, Pedro had no doubt that it was right. And now, as he was sitting in his office in a comfortable and warm chair, he profoundly reassessed his values. Thinking about life and the insurmountable problems that had arisen, Pedro realized that he had spent a significant part of his life with a very mercenary and greedy person. It suddenly occurred to him that Augusta was with him only because of his financial situation. Augusta didn't become his friend. Now, understanding the whole truth, he could compare their relationship to some business meetings with business partners. He had attended such meetings repeatedly and learned to find mutually beneficial compromises, just as in their family life. Suddenly, it turned out that Augusta was just a business partner. The only difference between real business partners and his wife was that Augusta didn't even want to seek a mutually beneficial solution to the problem. At any cost, she wanted to save money, and she mostly didn't care about her husband's life. Divorce, the thought flashed in Pedro's mind. Divorce wouldn't be a severe financial shock for him. The business and the apartment were his before their marriage, and the few pieces of updated furniture weren't expensive to the man. I shouldn't leave it like this. She'll drain everything out of me, he thought. Now he understood that if he sold his business, he would lose his wife as well, even though he no longer cared about that. The primary task was to treat liver cancer. The next day passed in tension. Pedro didn't want to have any contact with his wife in any way. She became so repugnant to him in an instant that he had to sleep on the living room couch that night. Augusta, too, if you can say so, was disappointed in her husband, although he was more disappointed in her. All this time, she sincerely believed that her husband was willing to sacrifice everything for her well-being. Ultimately, it reached such extremes that she no longer saw any boundaries and thought he owed her something. Deep down, she turned into a plain freeloader, and this was already irreparable. She simply concealed it fairly skillfully and professionally. Thus, this vile trait in her character could only be discerned at a critical moment. On the evening before the scheduled visit to the clinic, Pedro began packing his things. His flight was at 10 p.m., and by morning, he had to reach his destination. As he planned, he was going there for a few days, so he needed to pack enough things. He took with him some cash that he planned to spend on a possible paid consultation. Due to the joy of finding a proper clinic, he completely forgot to clarify this. He had to pay for transportation and food, as well as for booking a hotel room, which he had also already chosen. Tossing a few pairs of regular blue jeans, two sweatshirts, three t-shirts, and a couple of pairs of underwear into his suitcase, Pedro was getting ready to leave the apartment. These days, they hardly communicate. Augusta silently cooked food, did the laundry, and attended to her own matters, while Pedro, hoping to focus on work, read reports from his company. He had informed the management and partners that he would step away from business for an unknown period, but would definitely return. Pedro deeply regretted telling Augusta about his intention to sell his stake in the company to pay for treatment and rehabilitation. He reached for his jacket on the hanger near the door when his wife appeared in the living room doorway. Leaving? She asked, crossing her arms businesslike over her chest. Yes, Pedro replied tersely. What is it? Are you worried about me? No, I'm planning to pack my things and move away from you. I can't stand your character, she declared. I've tolerated it for several years, and when it came to money, I suddenly became unpleasant. Fine. I won't hide it, but it's true. Tomorrow, I'm packing my things and leaving you. I know the law well, and I understand that I won't be able to get anything from you through legal action. You know, I think I've needed this for a long time. What have you needed? Pedro asked with a sarcastic smirk. To live off your husband, fill your pockets with money, and set off on a carefree journey? Good luck, I won't stand in your way. 
That sounds so cheeky from your perspective, Augusta replied, squinting her eyes. From my point of view, I'm finally becoming independent. I'm so tired of being your personal housewife, Pedro. A housewife? Pedro asked in surprise. Are you serious? Yes, I'm completely serious, Pedro. I'm doing nothing, not evolving. It burdens me, and I don't want to live like this anymore. In what sense are you doing nothing? Explain that to me, please, Pedro protested. I didn't fire you. You're still working for my company, just remotely. Did you ask me about it when I moved in with you? If something didn't suit you, you wouldn't have moved. Why did you agree to move here, to the north, then? Oh, forget it. Let's skip these pointless arguments that lead to nothing, Augusta replied, pressing her hand to her forehead. You've cornered yourself, and now you're avoiding the conversation, Pedro noted, putting on his jacket. Fine, I won't hold you back. Pack your things and leave. Don't bother claiming the apartment or the business. I know. I already said that. I don't need them. Besides, you're planning to sell the company anyway, Augusta replied. Maybe I'm not, Pedro responded. Maybe I said that in the heat of the moment. No, Pedro. I already know that your own life is more valuable to you than that of any company or even your own wife. Tell me, dear, Pedro raised his voice noticeably, what have you done to make yourself more important to me than my own life? That's not for me to judge. Then what are we arguing about? Pedro glared at his wife angrily. What did you want to say? You'll have a lot of free time at the hotel. You can think about what I wanted to say there. You're disgusting. How could I live with you all this time? You're like a snake on my neck, Pedro replied, fastening his jacket. Turning around, he added, leave the keys at the neighbor's. Lorenza lives there. She's a nice, honest girl, unlike you. When I arrive, I'll call her and ask if you gave her the keys. I'll bring them. You don't need to worry about me. I don't want anything from you, Augusta calmly replied. I will withdraw the money from the savings account. You have no right, Pedro calmly replied. It's marital. We'll divide it in the case of divorce, don't worry. He didn't bother listening to what Augusta might say in response. He silently left the apartment, slamming the door. Pedro fell asleep on the plane. He woke up instinctively when all the passengers started getting up from their seats. The flight attendant didn't even have to wake him. Rubbing his semi-sleepy, sticky eyes with his hand, Pedro looked out the window. The takeoff strip of an unfamiliar airport somehow immediately evoked doubts in the man. He assumed that, like most ordinary people during a time zone change, he would experience a headache and other emotional factors, but fears and anxiety were not part of his plans. He successfully retrieved his suitcase at the baggage claim and exited the airport. It was an unknown city with no snow, unlike the one where he lived. Suddenly, he felt lonely, like an unwanted person in an unfamiliar place. The only comforting thought was that he would be here for a very short time, just a couple of days. He felt similarly unwanted when he moved to the capital city. In his youth, as soon as he graduated from college, he decided to move far away from his small town. He went to a big metropolis in search of a better life because the one he had lived throughout his youth was categorically unsatisfactory. He grew up, as mentioned before, in a small town and young Pedro couldn't live there comfortably. Since childhood, he has dreamt of becoming a successful leader, steering a big company, and being an authority figure for others, a successful example, a model to follow. Even at a young age, he was aware that he was much smarter than his parents. Until the age of four, he grew up in a complete family that was far from dysfunctional. Despite the widespread turmoil in the country, Pedro's family somehow managed to navigate through life's hardships, avoiding the grinding difficulties that could have crushed Pedro's family. His father, Emilio Jimenez, worked as a security guard at a daycare center. He neither drank nor smoked, and he was a very fair and honest man. Pedro's mother, Nora Jimenez, worked as the head of the cafeteria in the local hospital. 
To ensure a decent life for her family, she was willing to go to any lengths, utilizing her position to ensure her child lacked nothing. While other children in the neighborhood played with old, dull wooden toys, little Pedro was content with modern imported toys. Similarly, while other kids wore hand-me-downs, as Nora called them, Pedro dressed quite well. When Pedro was four years old, his grandmother, Pedro's mother, passed away, and Emilio, his father, started drinking. This unexpected loss devastated him. He began drinking, leading to discord and conflicts in the family. Two years later, he disappeared without a trace. Nora, nursing resentment for her husband, whose drinking she tolerated for two years, didn't bother looking for him. Law enforcement agencies handled the matter, but they couldn't locate him. Nora seemed completely indifferent to her alcoholic husband. Despite his family's financial struggles, Pedro never boasted or flaunted it. He understood that he was just like any other child. He willingly let his friends in the neighborhood play with his new, fashionable toys, always helped them, and generally didn't display any superiority. As Pedro grew into a teenager, he realized that this town was not where he belonged. It was small, with no prospects for growth. One day, he expressed his future plans to his mother, and she reacted strongly. She had different plans for her son and seemed unwilling to consider his opinion. You will receive education as an electrician, and when you finish it, you will become an economist, she replied. What capital are you talking about? What business? This was the beginning of his growing resentment towards his mother. Unpleasant as it was for Nora to acknowledge, her son was much smarter and more forward-thinking than she was. From his father, Pedro inherited honesty and fairness, and from his mother, the opposite qualities, cunning nature and vanity, but in a reasonable measure. These entirely different qualities coexisted remarkably well in this young man. After finishing college, Pedro, without saying anything to his mother, bought a ticket to the capital using the money he had saved from his scholarship and left. He left his mother a so-called farewell note, Mom, I want to address you probably for the last time. I understand perfectly well that I'm your son, and with your character, you don't accept my point of view. I don't want to offend you, but I'm stating facts. By nature, you are excessively selfish, or more precisely, egocentric. But I'm 19 now. Due to health problems, as you well know, I'm not fit for military service, so the road to life is open for me. I believe my level doesn't match the place where you'd like to see me. I have to leave now. I don't accept any remarks or, as you call them, warnings on this matter. I will live the way I want because, in my opinion, I deserve better. I think in your pursuit of happiness, you completely forgot that I am your son, not a puppet. I am a different person. I, like all normal people, intend to strive for the best. Maybe you would have made an excellent leader, but I'm not your subordinate. I have grown up independently, leaving this parental nest. I am leaving for the capital. I have some action plans, but I know you have no intention of listening to me, so I'm stating it as a fact. In the capital, I'm sure a better life awaits me. Forgive me for this, Mom, but I probably got this independence or selfishness from you, but I understand that in my case, this selfishness is within reason. I hope we'll meet again someday. You'll see me on TV or read an article about me. I will definitely come back, Mom. See you. Pedro left during the day, and Nora returned from work only in the evening. After reading the letter, she almost had a heart attack. Although she genuinely tried to control her son harshly out of fear that he would grow into a criminal, those fears had a basis back then. She couldn't even grasp that her son understood this himself. Pedro had no intention of becoming a bandit or a drug addict. No, he knew his worth. Practically, he devoted his entire childhood to books and various documentaries to understand how different structures work. Pedro diligently studied history and was fascinated by psychology to understand people's motivations with whom he would have to collaborate in the future. In simpler terms, from a very young age, practically from the first grade, he began preparing himself for an adult and challenging life in which he was absolutely certain he would achieve great success. A few days into the tedious bus journey to the capital, 
Pedro got off at an unfamiliar stop. Just like then and now, he felt like a small person in a huge metropolis, unnoticed and inconspicuous. The only difference between the current situation and then was that Pedro was now a mature man. Exiting the airport with his suitcase, he started looking for a taxi. Usually, there were persistent private taxi drivers near various stations who charged double or even triple the official rates. And indeed, he found such a car. It was a great foreign car. Pedro wasn't good at identifying car brands, and there was an inconspicuous orange checkered sign on the roof. A man of Spanish appearance, wearing a cap with thick black mustaches and a small, sparse beard, was standing near the car. Pedro immediately headed in his direction. Hello, he approached the taxi driver named Vasco. Hey, man, the man replied, spreading his arms. Where are you going, my dear? I'll get you there quickly. I know all the roads around here. Pedro glanced at his wristwatch. He had 3.5 hours left before his appointment at the clinic. How long does it take to get to the clinic from here? The man asked. Well, I'll tell you right now. The taxi driver closed his eyes and began to softly hum, recalling the route. It takes an hour and a half to get there without traffic jams, he finally answered. And with traffic jams? Well, with traffic jams. Listen, who knows, right? Vasco smiled kindly. An hour or two, maybe three. It depends on the traffic, you know. What about the price? Pedro asked mischievously. Listen, we'll figure out the price. Come on, jump in, and let's go. The naive taxi driver didn't yet know who he was dealing with. He thought he could easily rip off Pedro for money, but Pedro stood his ground. No. Tell me the price. I won't go until you tell me the amount. Three, Vasco sharply replied. Three thousands. Vasco frowned, envisioning the route from the airport to the clinic, which would take an hour and a half under favorable conditions. Agreed. 3,000 for 1.5 hours of driving without traffic or 3 hours with traffic. If you get me there in less than an hour without traffic, I'll pay half. Deal? Listen, what's your name, sir? He took a step forward. Pedro, Pedro confidently replied. My name is Vasco. Listen, what's with this audacity? I'm already giving you a discount and you're putting your conditions on me. 1,500 if you get me there in less than an hour without traffic. If there are traffic jams, then 1,500 if you get me there in less than 1.5 hours. What if it takes longer than 1.5 hours without traffic? Vasco asked. In that case, we'll settle it on the spot. Just so you know, if you crawl like a snail, we'll have a talk, so let's go and ride at a normal speed. Look at how persistent you are. Listen, what do you do, man? Vasco approached Pedro from the side and threw his hand on his shoulder. Are you some kind of businessman? Why does it matter? Pedro replied, smiling. Either agree, Vasco, or I'll go to that other car. It seems like a simpler deal there. I'll definitely make a deal with him. The man chuckled. Look at him. Okay, we've got a deal. Let's go. Vasco opened the trunk, Pedro loaded his suitcase, and they headed to the specified address. They arrived at the clinic almost exactly one and a half hours later. Despite his initial impression of deceiving the naive customer, Vasco didn't lie, and Pedro paid 3000 After bidding farewell to the driver, Pedro took the suitcase by the handle and entered the clinic. He waited for the appointment for 2.5 hours. The same receptionist, the girl he had spoken to on the phone the day before yesterday, was sitting at the front desk. Hello, I have an appointment with Roberto. Pedro forgot the surname of the doctor he was supposed to see. Roberto Fernandez? Toya clarified. Yes, him. I called you the day before yesterday. I'm Pedro. Yes, I see. Pedro, you have an appointment at 2 o'clock. Please tell me your last name and first name.
Pedro Jimenez, the man dictated. Okay, thank you. You can sit on the bench for now. In which office should I go? Pedro asked. Oh, sorry, Toya giggled. I completely forgot. The eighth office. Thank you very much, Pedro replied, and he walked down the corridor, searching for the eighth office. Finding the right door, he placed his suitcase next to the bench, took off his jacket, sat on the white bench, and began to wait for the appointed time. Meanwhile, there was no one in the corridor, but on the adjacent bench, there was someone's jacket. About an hour passed, and a middle-aged but elegantly dressed woman came out of Roberto's office. She hurried to retrieve her clothes from the neighboring seat, and a mustached and bald man around 60 in a tightly buttoned white robe followed her. Hello. Are you Pedro? The man addressed Pedro politely. Hello, yes, it's me. Good, come in, he said, gesturing for the patient to enter the office. Pedro glanced at his watch. He had always tried to adhere to a work discipline, even though he sometimes failed. The time on the clock showed 12.34 p.m. But it's not yet, he tried to object. Come in, come in, Roberto interrupted Pedro, and he complied. The office looked very hospital-like, light gray walls, and all the decor, including furniture, was in a similar color scheme. Tell me about your issue, Pedro, Roberto addressed him, listening attentively to his patient. I've already had tests done, but in a different clinic, Pedro began. I'm not local, I live in the north. And they told me I had liver cancer. I was troubled by side pains, right in the liver area, loss of appetite, nausea, and overall weight loss. Are any of these bothering you now? Roberto asked, as if following a script. I can't say so, Pedro replied thoughtfully. I have a headache, but I don't think it's particularly related to this. It might be related, the doctor said confidently. How about your appetite? Any issues with it? Yes, maybe. Pedro said, still unsure. Lately, I haven't been eating much. What kind of lifestyle were you leading? Roberto asked. Well, before all this, before these symptoms, I tried to lead a healthy lifestyle. I was into sports, ate well, didn't smoke, and didn't drink. Okay, the doctor said, looking at his computer monitor. You'll need to undergo an examination and take tests. You can do it right now. We'll organize the results very quickly in about an hour. That's wonderful, Pedro said sincerely. Tell me, how much will it cost? The tests and the evaluation will cost a total of $30,000 each. You'll need to give a blood sample. Okay, I agree. On the same day, Pedro took all the necessary tests prescribed by Roberto Fernandez. Immediately after the examination, they went together to the laboratory located in the same clinic. Blood was drawn from a vein, and within an hour, as the specialist promised, the results were ready. We have the most modern equipment for identifying disruptions in the overall body system and, in particular, detecting cancer cells, he explained when Pedro found himself in his office again. That's great, but what about my test results? The patient asked anxiously. I won't hide anything from you. I'll tell you as it is, Roberto said calmly and confidently. It has been confirmed that you have cancer. It's worth noting that it's developing quite rapidly. When did you take the previous tests at the other clinic? About a week or a week and a half ago, Pedro replied, bewildered. Yes, the doctor confirmed. It's indeed progressing very fast. We can try to treat you, but the chances are low, although, again, it depends on the treatment methods. But in your case, the methods will be, of course, the most advanced and complex, increasing the chances of survival. Why did all my symptoms disappear? Pedro asked like a robot, staring into space. It happens. I won't delve into medical terminology right now. I'll just say that it happens. And how much will this treatment cost? Around 10 million, Roberto said calmly. I don't have that kind of money right now. Tell me, how long do I have left to live? I think you're ordinary, 
peaceful life may come to an end in a couple of months. After that, some agony and constant suffering will begin. Trust me, I know what I'm talking about. The road back. Everything seemed shrouded in mist, surrounded by darkness. Not a single positive thought. Everything revolved around the fact that life was coming to an end. Realizing this was painfully sad, sorrowful, and bitter. Almost all of his free time Pedro dedicated to work. And now, when life seemed to be coming to an end, he, like an old man on his deathbed, looking back, realized that he had made a huge mistake. He hadn't managed to see the world, he hadn't done everything he had planned for life back in his teenage years. As if everything went off course. He somehow didn't account for a deadly illness. He decided not to stay on this ill-fated business trip and chose to return home as soon as possible. He was determined to sell his stake in the company. He could easily cover all the expenses for treatment if he did that. The only problem was time. Selling his stake is a lengthy and tedious process. Firstly, he needed to find someone willing to buy it, and even Pedro couldn't estimate approximate terms. Outside the clinic, where his worst fears were confirmed, there was one available taxi. It wasn't Vasco behind the wheel, but another man who also easily took Pedro to the airport. However, the passenger, accustomed to various profitable deals, didn't haggle this time, but agreed to the price set by the private driver. He had no time for that now. He sincerely hoped that there would be available tickets for a return flight to the north, even with layovers, at the airport. Anxious thoughts overwhelmed him on the way, growing in scale geometrically. Looking out the window at the nighttime city, where, unlike his hometown, there was no snow, Pedro thought that soon he would turn into a similar darkness himself. Again, literally in a moment, he simply devalued his life and everything he had achieved in these short 35 years. He now couldn't care less about the conditions his employees would have in the company under the new owner, who would get his apartment and all his belongings. And more. There was nothing more in his life, only the company and a large apartment in a good, elite residential complex. That was it. His wife turned out to be a greedy person who sacrificed her sick husband for personal prosperity. They had no children. Augusta never wanted to have children, justifying it by saying there simply wouldn't be time for them. Pedro settled with the driver, picked up his suitcase, and walked back into the airport waiting area. Approaching the counter, he asked, When is the next flight to the north? Today. How lucky, the man thought. One ticket, please. He paid the cashier, received his ticket, and, looking at the departure board, realized he had to wait here for quite some time, two hours. He calmly sat on a bench and continued to contemplate how meaningless life was. Darling, we'll buy a ticket now and fly, a woman passing by Pedro with her seven-year-old daughter cheerfully said. Really? The little girl asked with sincere astonishment. Yes, Wanda, we'll fly. Pedro opened his eyes and looked at this family. How lucky this woman was, she had a beautiful daughter who, by the way, looked like her. She was healthy, everything was fine with her, and she was raising this beautiful daughter. The girl was lucky too, she had a mom, and for now, there were no problems. The inner voice engaged in a dialogue with Pedro's mind. Stop, what? Mom? The little girl has a mom. She has a mom. At this moment, the man's reasoning began to converse with the inner voice, Mom. So, wait, I have one too. He quickly jumped off the bench and, bypassing the young family, rushed to the counter. Excuse me, cancel it. He began shouting at the cashier. What? The young cashier didn't understand initially. What do you mean? Cancel my ticket. Please change it. I need to go to another city. There's another flight, but it's departing in 40 minutes. Okay, I need one ticket there. The procedure for changing the ticket didn't take long, and the inspired man, grabbing his suitcase, quickly headed to the boarding gate. He made it. He took the seat indicated on the ticket and breathed a sigh of relief. Mama, I have a mom. He continued talking to himself in his head. I'll see my mom. How long? 
How much time has passed? 10. No, more. 16. What a nightmare. I haven't seen my mom for 16 years. Well, now I'll see her. The plane took off and flew to his hometown. The flight lasted five hours. During this time, Pedro managed to sleep on the plane and, surprisingly, get some rest. In the last 24 hours, he had left the airport for the second time, but this time he didn't feel like an insignificant person in a big, unknown city. He knew exactly why he had come here. Besides, the city was familiar to him. It was the place where he spent an integral part of his youth. Pedro still remembered the address where he and his mother lived. But they lived not in the city itself, but in a small settlement nearby. Taking the first available taxi, he stated the address, initially surprising the driver, and they headed to the small town. It was already dawn, and the beautiful rising sun illuminated the fields or forest belts with its bright orange dawn color. There was snow here, but not as much as in the north. It only partially covered the ground. The journey to Pedro's homeland took a little, only about 40 minutes. He settled the bill with the taxi driver again, picked up his suitcase, and stood in front of his family home. It was by no means a multi-story building. It was a medium-sized yard that combined several private houses. This was the place where he grew up. The place where he spent the first part of his life, which was about to end so soon. He remembered everything when he saw his family home. He remembered playing in the common yard with friends from these neighboring houses and how they ran to each other's houses and sometimes stayed overnight. All of childhood seemed to rise to the top in an instant, as if dominating all other thoughts, including the deadly illness. Exhaling warm breath with a smile on his face, Pedro approached the gate. Suddenly, he saw a beautiful young woman coming out of the house where he lived, and this house stood right in front of the entrance to the yard. She was dressed similarly to Pedro, regular blue jeans, a black jacket with a hood pulled over her head. She wore high, warm felt boots. As soon as she left the house, she immediately noticed the man standing with a suitcase in front of the gate. Hello. She shouted with a thin, enchanting, and very beautiful voice. Who are you looking for? Hello, Pedro shouted confusedly. Who lives in the house you just came out of? The girl, looking around, quickly descended the low steps of the house and ran to the gate. It's me and my mom, so, to speak, what is it? Pedro became even more confused. For some reason, initially, he didn't even consider the possibility that his mom might have moved from this house to another place. He tried to pull himself together and asked, Nora Jimenez used to live here. Do you know where she moved? She still lives here, the girl answered, surprised. And who are you, actually? Wait, I don't understand anything, Pedro interrupted. You said you and your mom live here, right? Well, she's not exactly my mom, the girl said, embarrassed. And who are you? Can you tell me? I'm her son, Pedro exclaimed, and I don't quite understand why I have a sister. So you're her son? The astonished girl exclaimed as if meeting her childhood idol. Well, yes, Pedro calmly replied, but deep down, he felt some guilt. Can I visit my mom? Of course, come in. The girl opened the gate, and Pedro, carrying the suitcase in his hand, entered the yard, reminiscent of how he used to carry a briefcase to school. I assume your name is Pedro, right? The girl asked. Yes, Pedro. By the way, what's your name? You haven't introduced yourself. My name is Marta. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Pedro replied. Why did you say that you live here with your mom? Nora is not your mom at all. It's easier for me to say that, she said. You may not remember me or even know me. When you left, you were 19 and I was only 12. And my real mom, who lived on Oak Street. Maybe you remember, it's on the other side of the city. My mom was good friends with yours. What's your mom's name? Pedro interrupted Marta. Her name was, she said softly, Zoraida Castro. 
You might remember her. Ah! exclaimed Pedro. Yes, I remember Zoraida. The whole neighborhood used to visit her for fortune telling. Was that her? Yes, Marta replied. And my mom passed away when I was 12. Nora, your mom, felt sorry for me and took me in. Do you know how she grieved when you left? She couldn't find peace, took tranquilizers, and barely ate. It is difficult to convey in words what Pedro felt at that moment. His heart pounded in his chest as if it were not a heart but a washing machine. He felt incredibly ashamed. He felt guilty towards his mother, but he couldn't have acted differently. Circumstances led him that way. Meanwhile, Marta and Pedro entered the house. You go inside, and I'll run to the store, Marta whispered. It's six in the morning. What store? Pedro wondered. We recently got a 24-hour one. We ran out of bread at home. I'll be back soon. And the girl rushed out of the house. Marta, why are you running back and forth? A senile voice came from somewhere in the room. Did you forget something? Deciding not to make unnecessary noise, Pedro quietly took off his shoes, left the suitcase in the hallway, which, as he assumed, had been renovated by Marta since his departure, and went into the room. He entered the living room, from which he heard the voice. The voice hadn't changed much in 16 years, it just gained a bit of hoarseness. Such a familiar yet, at the same time, forgotten voice sent shivers down the man's spine. Marta, Nora shouted even louder, are you here? Entering the living room, where an elderly woman with gray but well-groomed hair was sitting, wearing glasses with thick frames, Pedro couldn't utter a single word. Everything he was psychologically prepared for at that moment was just a nod in greeting. The old lady, sitting on the sofa and getting ready to turn on the television, looked at the man. It was as if she didn't recognize him at first and didn't understand who ended up in her house. There was some random person. It seemed that this was the initial thought of the elderly woman. But then, a couple of seconds later, when she was able to look well enough into the face of this unfamiliar man, the woman's shock was clear. Her eyes literally bulged out, and she dropped the remote control from her hands. It fell to the floor and cracked so that the cover of the battery compartment flew off. Both of their breathing quickened. Pedro, holding out his arms as if to signal his readiness for a strong embrace, tearfully said, Mom, I'm home. At that very moment, Nora literally jumped up from the couch and quickly ran to her son. Pedro! She shouted, My dear Pedro has come home. She held her son tightly, whom she hadn't seen in 16 years, and started kissing him. It's hard to describe the emotions of a mother who knew nothing about what was happening with her son over the last 16 years. Some mothers, especially the irresponsible ones, come to accept this or completely forget that they ever had children. On the other hand, those who truly love their children are willing to give everything they have just to make sure their child is doing well. But it's even harder to describe the emotions of a mother who didn't know what her son had been doing, or indeed if he had been alive at all, over the last 16 years, and who, after such a colossal length of time apart from her child, met him for the first time. Primitive, genuine maternal feelings never fade, even when a mother hasn't seen her child for 16 years. They gradually diminish, retreating to the depths of the soul, but they remain for a lifetime. They may not manifest themselves in everyday life, being completely concealed behind a mask of moral well-being, but deep inside, a mother who was separated from her son would wake up every day with hope that today he would come home, that today she would see him and understand that her child was safe and well. This was exactly the case with Nora, the mother of Pedro Jimenez. She never forgot her son. Every day she prayed for his health, although before her son's departure, she was a convinced atheist and thought that now, somewhere in the world, her child was alive and well. Marta, today is a special day for me. Nora burst into the hallway, crying and shouting, when she heard the noise of the front door closing. Go to the store again and buy a cake. We will celebrate. Pedro has come back. Nora, I know he's come. I was the one who met him, the girl said with a smile on her face. 
I immediately understood what I needed to buy, besides bread. They went to the kitchen, where Pedro was already sitting, awkwardly looking around the room. It's as if everything has changed, and yet nothing has changed, he thought, surveying the kitchen. Pedro, how are you? Tell me, son. I haven't seen you in so many years. Joyful Nora literally shared her positive energy with her son, who, deep down, felt incredibly ashamed. But these feelings faded away under the pressure of his mother's good mood. Mom, everything is fine, Pedro nodded calmly, not yet ready to start with the bad. I have my own business in the capital, a very decent one, actually. I have a large network of retail stores, and I live in the north, it's easier for me there. See, Pedro always wanted to go to the city, Nora waved her index finger, addressing Marta. He always wanted to go north. I remember that for sure. Yes, he wanted and left, Marta confirmed, slicing the cake. Yes, Pedro is a good guy, just great, the elderly woman couldn't be happier about her son. So, Pedro, I'm already an old woman. Tell me, do I have any grandchildren? How's your personal life going? And here the problems begin, Pedro answered with a shameful smirk, lowering his head. What's the matter? I'm getting divorced now. Nora gasped theatrically. How so, Pedro? Why are you getting divorced? And who is this girl? My wife, still my wife, is named Augusta. I met her through business. I hired her as my accountant. You know, Mom, at first, she was a good girl, honest, and faithful. Well, only at first. Then she moved to the north with me. I already had my own apartment. And just a week ago, she showed her snake nature. She was with me only for the money. She had no genuine feelings for me. Perhaps she's not like that in reality, but that's how she showed herself. And what now? Will you have a divorce? Nora, the elderly mother, fussed. Yes. When I get home, I'll file for divorce. Son, she'll probably sue for half of your apartment and the company. No, Mom, she won't. Pedro said confidently. I earned all of this when I was alone. The apartment and the company will remain mine. Marta served the cake on the table, and by this time, the pot had just boiled. They chatted about many things. There was a lot to talk about in 16 years. They discussed almost Pedro's entire life, but, without revealing the fact of the cancer, also discussed Nora's life, how she suffered in the early years when her son left the parental home and didn't get in touch in any way. She shared her worries and shed a few tears. She also talked about how she practically adopted Marta after the death of her mother, Zoraida Castro. She said everything she could. Marta also shared her fate, which she described as not easy, but bearable. After discussing all the pressing topics and answering all the questions that had accumulated over 16 years of separation, which took about four hours, it was time to tell Pedro's main tragedy. Mom, you know, I came here for a reason, Pedro said, taking a sip from his third or fourth cup of coffee. He lost count of how many he had. I have a big problem, and I just couldn't help but come. He hesitated for a moment, choosing his words, while Marta and Nora froze in anticipation. What is it? The elderly woman exclaimed, clutching her heart. What happened, son? What is troubling you? Easy, Nora, Marta calmly said, but her attention was entirely focused on Pedro. Let him speak. She looked at him very intently, but the man himself didn't see that. Mom, he said, wiping his eyes, I have liver cancer. Nora now clutched her heart much tighter. What? What did you say, Pedro? Please repeat. With each word, her speech became softer and softer, and she took off her glasses. I have liver cancer. It's progressing very rapidly. Actually, I came to say goodbye. The treatment will cost $10 million. I can get that money quickly only by selling my share of the company, but I won't sell it quickly. I won't take a loan on principle. Over the past two days, I've thought about a lot, come to many conclusions, and reassessed a lot. 
I've already accepted my fate, mom, and I just came to say goodbye. After the warm receptions of the prodigal son and the solemn coffee drinking ceremony for his return, many tears were shed. Nora literally began to have a hysterical fit, which would be very, very difficult to stop. Pedro himself felt nothing anymore after announcing such terrible news because, in the two days preceding this day, he had genuinely reconsidered a lot, ultimately coming to the conclusion that this was his destiny. Nora cried seemingly endlessly. All her hopes that her son had returned and that her child was safe and sound were shattered in an instant. She couldn't believe this news. She couldn't trust her ears. Pedro, can I talk to you for a couple of minutes? Marta asked when Nora had calmed down somewhat and was just sitting silently. We need to talk. Pedro, not expecting such an offer, was very interested in talking to the girl. He didn't know what she might say to him, and it piqued his genuine interest. But even more intriguing was the fact that she wanted to talk about it with him alone, without Nora. They went outside. After the ordinary home atmosphere, the white sky from which snow was falling seemed like a lamp shining directly into their eyes. For a couple of seconds, it blinded both Marta and Pedro. Pedro, the girl began when she closed the door, I should explain something to you. Tell me as it is. I'll understand everything, Pedro calmly replied. You're urban, and for you, explaining such things is a thousand or even ten thousand times harder than for locals, or at least those who live in a village. Well, just tell me, Pedro insisted. My mother was a fortune teller, a witch, a sorceress, call it whatever you want, Marta began. She had the gift of healing, you know? So, the whole village used to come to her. Mostly, they were just alcoholics whose livers were out of order, and she healed them with her gift. And what are you trying to tell me with this? Pedro's reaction indicated that, as Marta initially said, he was quite skeptical about this information. The gift of healing is passed down through the family line, the girl tried to convince the man. I can try to heal you. Are you making fun of me? Pedro asked, making a strange facial expression. I've already accepted my fate, and you still want to tell me that you can cure me of liver cancer, which is developing very rapidly. Specialists demand $10 million for this treatment, and you want to do it with some fortune telling. Pedro, Marta said, looking at her interlocutor with a pleading look, you can at least try. You won't need to do anything. I'll do everything by myself. Well, almost everything. It's free. I'm not asking for money from you. And how long will this operation last? Pedro emphasized the word operation. I don't know. I have to try. I have a book with spells for all diseases, including cancer. We just need to see how to read this spell and what rituals need to be performed. Well, if you insist, we can try, Pedro said, as if doing a favor. But I think it will be a waste of time. We'll see. Pedro, why are you asking me here, not inside? The man asked when Marta was already about to enter the house. For the spell to work, the person who needs healing must give personal consent without outsider's ears. Only after he has agreed face-to-face -to, -face to the ceremony and spell can this information be made public, so to speak. They entered the house, and Marta first ran into her room, which 16 years ago used to be Pedro's room. She found the book, in which many spells were recorded by her grandmother, Antonia Gill, and found a spell for cancer. The spell, if one could say it that way, was universal and suitable for all stages and types of cancer. The ritual took place that same night. Marta informed Nora that she intended to cure her son of this dreadful ailment. Nora couldn't sleep. She spent the whole night in bed, waiting for Marta to come out and say that everything was successfully completed. Marta conducted the ritual in her room. There were many nuances, and sometimes Pedro himself had to read incomprehensible incantations in an unfamiliar language. Throughout this strange, previously unknown procedure, he was sitting in complete bewilderment, but he maintained a fairly skeptical attitude. A few hours later, the door from Marta's room opened, and she entered Nora's room to check if she was asleep. 
Nora wasn't, so Marta could immediately report that everything went well and that it should have bore fruit. Two days later, Pedro flew by plane to the same clinic, where he was asked for $10 million for treatment. He decided to check if the spell worked and still approached it quite skeptically. Marta insisted that he be re-examined. He paid this private hospital another $30,000 for quick and accurate results. Roberto, after reviewing them, was astonished. How is this possible? He said, covering his mouth with his hand. Just a few days ago, you were diagnosed with a liver tumor, and now... And now it's clear as if it evaporated. Could our equipment be inaccurate? It can't be. Pedro himself had become so accustomed to such swift changes in his surroundings that he wasn't even surprised that some words in an unfamiliar language, spoken by a hereditary sorceress, could miraculously remove an almost incurable ailment from his body. In short, he returned to his mother with good news, and they once again celebrated with a cup of coffee and apple pie. Nora was very happy that her son had recovered. A year passed. During this year, Pedro experienced rapid and abrupt changes. He divorced his wife, and the savings account, which she was reluctant to spend on her husband's treatment, was split in half. The apartment and the company remained, of course, with Pedro. Pedro started communicating a lot with Marta. They exchanged messages, and eventually, they began a long-distance relationship. Soon, the girl moved in with him, and later, after saving some money, the man bought an apartment for his mother in the north, in the same area where Pedro lived with Marta. After living together for six months in previously unfamiliar harmony and love, one morning, Marta, over a cup of morning coffee, said, Pedro, I don't even know how to tell you this, a shy smile appeared on her face. What's wrong? Pedro suddenly felt nervous. Pedro, there's something. Your mom will be over the moon with happiness. In short, I bought a pregnancy test yesterday. We're going to have a baby. Pedro caught his breath. He hugged Marta tightly and closed his eyes, which were suddenly filled with tears. Pedro, are you happy? The girl pretended to frown. Pedro smiled and kissed Marta. My love, I'm not just happy. I'm tremendously happy. If you're enjoying it as well, leave a like and subscribe to the channel.